The Anthropocene, that's one of the key concepts in the book, and actually that drives the whole book. What is the Anthropocene? And just a short summary. The Anthropocene is a proposed new geological era where humans are the main driving force of planetary change. And I've heard this a couple of times, and you've heard this a couple of times, but I think you really get to the depth of that concept when you bump into these weird examples of how deeply we influence nature and planet Earth. And this is one example, some of you might have heard it before. It's one of my favorite examples. 10 years ago, an NGO discovered a new monkey species in Bolivia, uh, the titi monkey. And as an attempt to collect money to protect this new monkey, uh, they organized an auction, an online auction, and the person or company winning the auction won the right to name the monkey, right, forever. And the company that won for $650,000 was an online casino called goldenpalace.com. So the official name of the monkey is goldenpalace.com titi monkey. And I'm not kidding. And it has an, uh, an, uh, an um, the official name in, in Latin is Calisiebus auripalati. My Latin is a little rusty. But that also means golden palace <laughs> in Latin. Which is quite sad, right? So is this a sad Anthropocene? It gets even more bizarre when you know that goldenpalace.com also won another auction on a grilled cheese toast with the face of Virgin Mary for 28,000 US dollars. Uh, so that's a sad Anthropocene. But I think there's a deep, deep, deep message actually behind this example, a very serious example. And it has to do with environment or ecology, in this case biodiversity, the protection of biodiversity, a critical uh, issue at a global scale. It has to do with politics, right? The need uh, to collaborate not only uh, within governments but also with private companies and NGOs, etc. How, how do we allow private actors to move into biodiversity conversation, conservation in this way? And also about technology. Who would have thought that an online casino would have the rights to name a monkey 20 or 30 years ago? So it has to do with the interplay between environment, politics, and technology. And that's what I wanted to get at in this book, and that's what I wanted to explore. So technology matters. So this is one iconic visualization of the Anthropocene and how humans are influencing the planet. And if you think about it, how much of this is technology? I mean, the Anthropocene is the extension of our use of technology. So how do we make sense of technology and politics in the Anthropocene? And I have four case studies uh, in, the, in the book, four chapters. One deals with Earth system complexity. We know inc increasingly more about the Earth system and how different functions of the Earth system interplay. So it's not only climate change, but also biodiversity, ocean acidification, land use change, etc. And all these changes interplay. And trying to navigate this very complex Earth system, you also have to acknowledge that our rules, our institutions, are becoming increasingly more complex as well. So that short little video there, that visualization, uh, has been made by Rakim, and that actually shows uh, the interlinks between international environmental agreements over time. So it starts as a few bubbles of international agreements, but then over time become more and more connected and creates a very complex structure of international environmental agreements. So you have to navigate Earth, earth system complexity with institutional complexity. And how do you do that? So that's one chapter. Uh, another chapter has to do with information technologies and the revolution in new monitoring systems for epidemic outbreaks. Uh, so in that chapter, I look at what are the new potentials of these new monitoring systems and what do they do with the ways we govern ourselves to better deal with epidemics. Uh, and that chapter deals with an issue called super networks. Then there is a third uh, case study chapter, <coughs> which is more recent, uh, that deals with trade in financial markets and commodity markets. And it deals with the fact that trade in these markets not only is done by humans anymore, in fact, are increasingly done by computers, faster and faster through algorithms. And what are the implications for, for commodity prices, and what are the possible implications for food security, et cetera, et cetera. And then the fourth 
and probably the most controversial ca uh, case in the book is about geoengineering. Uh, technologies uh, that are supposedly uh, possible to use to rapidly deal with climate change. Uh, for example, one, one such proposal is to s uh, shoot up space mirrors. And if you shoot up space mirrors, you can sort of reflect away sunlight, and that would cool down the planet. And that is just one of many of these technologies. That's one additional case study. One term that I use uh, in this book is the Anthropocene gap. Uh, and that came to me after Frederick, uh, my colleague, asked me, so what is the, this book really about? Can you just summarize it in one good sentence? And I was like, oh, Frederick, come on. <laughs> and I said, well, actually, it's about some sort of gap. It's about a gap uh, between how we deal with the world and how the world actually looks like. So that was my take on it. And I think there's three dimensions to this. One is uh, a mental gap. We have expectations, we have memories, we have causal beliefs that I believe are based on older environmental problems. I think the new environmental problems that we're facing now due to the Anthropocene are very different from the ones that we had before. And that creates some very tangible mental gaps and challenges our abilities to understand what's happening. As a result, and I take this from a pure political science perspective, I think we as political scientists are failing uh, in analyzing these changes. The conceptual maps that we have, the methods, uh, the theories we have as political scientists are not up to date uh, to these sort of developments that we see uh, on the planet. And I think that's really a shame. And thirdly, because of these mental maps, uh, mental gaps, because of our lack to design uh, new conceptual models of the world, we also face a governance gap. We are unable to create institutions or governance modes that are up to the sort of complexity and dynamics of new uh, gener generation of uh, environmental problems. So just to give you an example, I mean, how do we see this? How, how, do, how do we see this gap emerging, uh, the Anthropocene gap? Before I go through that, just a very quick uh, definition uh, and something that I discuss in detail in the book, the notion of thresholds or tipping points. Many of you have heard this before, but just very quickly, if you think about a rubber band, and then you have a rubber band, and then you stretch it, it has an ability to bounce back, right? But if you push it too far, or the rubber band is old, or you've been cutting it or something, then it can snap, right? So it reaches a point beyond where it cannot recover. And this is a phenomenon that we see in many, many systems that we study here at the Resilience Center, all the way from, from coral reefs to forests and agro uh, landscapes, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so this is one recent thing. This came out on Monday in New York Times, uh, quote from two new studies that independently showed that something is happening in the West uh, uh, Antarctic ice sheet. So these are quotes from two scientists. This is really happening. It has past the point of no return. Something is happening in the West uh, Antarctica, which is melting away. And it's melting away irreversibly. And the interesting thing here in the bottom, that's where it is, the West Antarctic ice sheet, is that that change is not only irreversible, it also has a key function on the Earth system. So there's several of these so-called tipping elements in the Earth system. And what this sort of the, uh, event highlights, I believe, is something that we will expect uh, much more in the future in terms of debate. Something about tipping points, because there's several tipping points and they link to each other, and how these tipping points uh, begs us to ask new questions about technology. They're created by techno technology, but there are also suggestions on how to intervene actively to stay away from these tipping points. Do we need to send out uh, solar-powered ships out in the oceans that would spray out uh, salt particles and then wait, make clouds more white and in a sense also reflect away sunlight? Do we need to intervene more drastically to protect coral reef ecosystems now that we're moving in a phase of more rapid climate change than expected? And of course there are lots of politics in that involved. Certain political interests prefer those sort of quick fix solutions whereas others try to stop them. So it triggers new political challenges. And I think this triangle this interplay is going to be what defines uh, the most critical environmental political challenges 
in the next few years. The interplay between tipping points that are really critical for human well-being, suggestions on how to intervene and try to stop uh, systems to cross those tipping points through technology and new political challenges and conflicts emerging from that. But of course, it's not just doom and gloom. This is also another thing that I explore in the, in, in the book. Tipping points are critical because they allow new networked alliances to emerge. So if you look closely and you see uh, behind the negotiations of big international environmental agreements, you'll see the emergence of different forms of partnerships, global networks, uh, campaigns, etc. The people, uh, people and actors are becoming increasingly concerned about tipping points and that triggers collective action. And that sort of collective action starts to influence these very uh, normally robust international environmental agreements. There's a push towards more formal uh, institutions coming from these networks. Uh, so that's also uh, something that you can see across these case studies. Okay, so just to wrap up, I mean, if technology matters, how do we more actively engage with technology? How do we understand technology? How do we look at it closer? Uh, so my personal view of this, I think we need to do three things as a community of scientists and people interested in these issues. One of them is bridge. There's a lack of collaboration. There's a deep, deep gap between ecologists or sustainability scientists and people developing technology. I see that, I see that as a critical, critical gap existing at the moment. If you look into the techno-utopian sphere, I mean, you can laugh about it. It's, it. There's clearly a misunderstanding or no understanding whatsoever of ecology. But if we look and reflect at ourselves, there's really very little understanding of technology within people doing sustainability science and, and ecology. So this needs to bridge. Obviously, when we do that bridging, of course, we need to have a critical look at what goes on. What are these technologies? Who's benefiting? Who's creating them? Uh, are the new risks evolving? How do we manage that? Right? So there needs to be that critical look. But lastly, of course, which is fun, I think we need to be better at playing with technologies. We need to engage with technologies. We need to touch them. We need to see what can we do with these new sensors? What can we do with 3D printing? What can we do uh, with uh, self-steering cars or drones or whatever? Is there any way we can tap into these changes in creative ways? And can we somehow gain some sort of control of these very, very rapid technological changes that we see. So bridge, uh, look, and play. I think that's going to be critical. Because unless we do that, I'm, qu I'm quite sure that, that we will not be able to create this vision of a good Anthropocene. I mean, a planet that is able to not only maintain, but also improve human well-being over many generations. Thank you. Great.